welcome. We want to welcome all of our viewers on our simulcast today, our live stream, where we are at the Unconference in Dallas, Texas. We call it an unconference because it's really more like a family reunion where we're just here. We have people on couches and all over this, this uh, room and we're just learning and enjoying and, and sharing our experiences around organizational health. And today in this live stream, we are going to talk about my new book, my latest book, which came out a week ago today, which is called The Motive. And, and I think, I just think it might be the most important book I've written. I know everybody wants to say that, you know, like, oh, my most recent child, he's the best, or she's the best. But, <laughs> but I think this actually might be the most important book I've written because, and, and, and if, if somebody had a stack of my books on a table and said, which one should I start with, I'd probably say do the motive first. Because it's not about how to manage or lead. Most of my books are about how to lead or how to manage or how to build a team. But it's about why. It's about why you would want to do it in the first place. And what I've learned is if your why is off, the hows don't really make any sense. So let me start by saying something kind of controversial or countercultural. And it goes like this. I think fewer people in society should become leaders. What I mean by that is this. When I go to a graduation, like a college graduation, and, uh, and somebody gets up there to speak and says, go out there and be leaders. Everybody should go out and be a leader. I want to stand up and say, no. <laughs> Don't be a leader unless you know why you would become a leader and you have the right motive. And most 22-year-olds don't. I mean, I certainly didn't get this when I was that age. Now, when I was a kid, everybody said, be a leader. And I was like, yeah, I'll do that. So I became a captain on our Little League teams and ran for student body president of my school. But did I really understand the motive for that? No. And if we don't have the right motive, bad things happen. And that's what we're going to talk about today. That's what we're going to talk about today. So let's talk about how this book came about. Two things happen. One, we have, and I don't know if the cameras can get a shot of him. Please do it. Alan, would you stand up? Alan Mullally is here. So Alan spoke earlier today and he was the man who took over the Ford Motor Company as CEO in 2008 and turned it around without taking government money. It was an amazing story. If you haven't read the book American Icon, I think you should go read it. It's fantastic. And Alan and I became friends because he read some of our stuff and, um, and, and we have a lot in common. He, he's done so much as a leader. Well, when we sat down to talk about my book, The Advantage, Alan actually pushed me on a few things. One, he said that I didn't spend enough time talking about the leader in the book. I only spent like two, two and a half pages. And secondly, he said, Pat, there's a part in your book when you say that leadership is a sacrifice and it's selfless and it's really a burden. And he said, I don't think so. He said, I think leadership is a privilege. It's an honor and it's a, it's a wonderful duty. Now, that you got to understand, he meant that. That's the kind of guy Alan is. Like I like to say, if, if Woody on Toy Story became an adult CEO, it would be Alan. Because he really believes this. He's got that Boy Scout kind of thing about him. But the truth of the matter is, as I said to Alan that day, because Alan is from Lawrence, Kansas, I said, Alan, you're not in Kansas anymore. Because the whole world isn't really like that. There's a lot of people that have become leaders for the wrong reason. And for them, if they don't understand leadership being a sacrifice, then they're probably not going to do it for the right reason. So Alan was really the one that pushed me and prompted me to write this. Then Karen and I, Karen, the woman who's responsible for organizing this conference, she and I were at a speech once. And, and I gave a talk at a leadership conference. And afterward, I went upstairs to a suite where we had like 20 CEOs in the room and they were asking me questions, which, I, which I, is fun for me. That's, I'm a kid in a candy store when I get to do that. And so we were sitting around up there in this hotel answering questions. And, and, and I was sharing them my advice. It was pretty straightforward. And I was noticing that a number of the CEOs were, were arguing with me about things. And they were like, I wouldn't do that. Why would you do that? And I said to Karen afterward, I said, what, what's going on there? And it dawned on us as we talked about it, and it gets back to what Alan and I talked about, is that they had a completely different, and I would say wrong, motive for wanting to be a CEO. And as a result, none of the advice I was giving them made any sense. All right? If I could get some water, that would be 
groovy. That'd be, oh, there's water. Oh, there it is. It's hidden. Terrific. Thank you. So what are the right and wrong motives for being a leader? The wrong motive, and it's very common, is this, that it's a reward for a lifetime of hard work. You finally become the principal or the pastor or the CEO or the head of the division, and I've arrived. Whoa, this is going to be great. Okay, I'm finally being rewarded for my hard work. That's very common and understandable. But when that's our motive, we are not going to want to do a lot of the things that only the leader can do. The right motive for being a leader is to become, is to be responsibility centered, not reward centered, responsibility centered. And that's to say this, this job I have is a huge responsibility. It's really quite a burden. And I have to do it because I care more about the people I lead than I do myself. You see, the personal economics of leadership are bad. If you add up, it's like the, pers the personal economics of parenthood are really bad. Right? And I have four boys and I'm in love with all of them. And, and my wife and I love being parents. But if you look at all the work that goes into it, you would never do this if you were being reward centered. Which is why it's really bad when people become a parent and they say, oh, this should be fun. It'll be a little accoutrement in my life. And it's like, oh, no, it's not. And you can imagine the problems that that creates. Well, imagine when somebody becomes a CEO of a company and they say, Ah, this is going to be great. See, if they do that, they're going to end up abdicating or delegating responsibilities that only the leader can do. You see, the leader has a lot of things, and there's a reason why we have leaders. I don't love overly hierarchical organizations, but I love hierarchy because we know where responsibility lies, and that's what the leader is. That's where the, where, you know, the buck stops there. And the leader has certain things that only the leader can do. And if the leader doesn't do them, nobody else will. If, you're, you, if a person is a reward-centered leader, these things aren't going to make sense a lot of them. And in fact, there are five, five responsibilities or tasks that reward-centered leaders tend to deflect, either by abdicating or delegating. These are not the five responsibilities of being a leader. These are the five that tend to get overlooked. Now, I want to say this to everybody here. It, this is not a black and white thing where you're either completely reward centered or completely responsibility centered. I've had, I've really loved the response we've gotten to this book right out of the gate from people who read it and said, whoa, I think I need to shift my, my motive because part of it is off. And I've looked at this and realized some of this stuff I can relate to it, it, certainly as well. So this is not about like you're either you're in or you're out, you're fired or you, you know, vote them off the island. This is about all of us starting with ourselves and really asking ourselves, what is our motive? And one good way to do that is to look at these five responsibilities and ask ourselves, do we want to do them? Now, Alan Mulally, when he read this book, and I talk about him in the book, said, I love all of them. And the answer to that is, of course you do, because you are the responsibility-centered leader. Okay, so let's talk about these five things. The first thing that many leaders abdicate or delegate if they're reward-centered and they just don't like to do this, is having difficult and uncomfortable conversations. This is maybe my favorite one to talk about because I can see people laughing and looking at one another. Is this the guy that doesn't like to have the uncomfortable? You know, he's the worst. Okay, good. That's good to know. I love that honesty. That's the kind of honesty. Transparency. So the, the, the truth of the matter is so many leaders don't want to have that uncomfortable conversation. And that's not just with their direct reports, it's with vendors, it's with customers, it's with like other people in the organization. If the leader doesn't model the way and, and enter the danger for these conversations, other people aren't going to do it. And I, there's so many stories around this. One of my favorites, it's really kind of tragic. It's, it's humorous and sad at the same time. I guess all comedy is rooted in tragedy. There's the CEO of a company, and I'll just tell you the punchline right up front. He actually wrote a book about leadership and management. And yet, this is the thing. I don't, you probably haven't read it. It didn't do all that well, thankfully. But um, just because he should not have written a book about it. He had a CIO in this big organization. He decided he wanted to hire another CIO. So he did. He hired a CIO. He didn't tell the old one that he was no longer going to be the CIO. And I couldn't write this in fiction if I wanted. Nobody would believe this. This is a big company. That CIO came to me, because I was doing work in one part of the organization, and said, what should I do? 
I said, well, you got to go talk to him. He goes, I know, I'm trying. And he'd call the CEO's assistant and say, I need to get in to see the CEO to talk about this. And he just never had time on his calendar. Literally, two weeks went by. The, the announcement came out, everybody welcome, Fred Johnson, our new CIO. And the old CIO is just dying inside because he hadn't been talked to. Finally, after a few weeks, this guy was going to ride on the corporate jet with the CEO. And he was going to have the conversation. They sat down across from one another. The CEO leaned back, closed his eyes, and slept the entire time and got off and never said a word. And finally, the old CIO, a very nice guy, just left. How in the, I mean, and okay, that's egregious, right? But let me tell you something, folks. Of these five things, this is one of the ones I find out most. We spend so much time and effort working around things when if somebody would just go right to the issue and call it out. This happens all the time. Once it happened to me, I worked in an organization directly for the CEO of a company before I started my own firm, and I was in charge of leadership development and communication, right? So I had my annual budget review with the chief financial officer. Any, chief, any CFOs in the room? Raise your hand if you're a CFO. Yeah, kind of like you guys, grumpy looking like that, you know, like <laughs> No, just the fact that you let these people come, I want to thank you for letting them come to the conference. <clears throat> This guy was an old school CFO, grumpy. And so I sat down to go over my budget for training and development and communication. And he said, Pat, before we get into your numbers, let me just tell you, if it were up to me, I'd fire you and your entire staff and put the savings to the bottom line of the company because I think this stuff you do is silly. California company, and I'm from California, so I thanked him for sharing. Thank you for sharing that with me. And then I said, hey, I'll call him Fred. Fred. These are the CEO's programs. You should just go have it out with the CEO and convince him that you're right and put me out of my misery here, or let him convince you that these programs are worthwhile and you can get on board. He goes, I'm not going to talk to him. I was like, then I will. He goes, I don't care. This is a true story. Next day, I knock on the CEO's door. I'm like, hey, Mark, Fred hates this stuff I'm doing for you. Doesn't want to fund it, complains about it. And the CEO said, oh, that's just Fred. Everybody, Fred's just like that. And I was like, well, he is just like that, but not everybody knows Fred. It's a huge company. And it hurts the programs. It, hurts, it makes the executive team look bad. You just got to go talk to him. And this is the answer I get often. Oh, I don't have the time and the energy for that. I don't have the time and the energy for that. He just couldn't walk next door and say, hey, Fred, what's going on? You can either choose to get on board, or if not, that's OK. I'll still love you, but you got to make a decision. But he wouldn't do that. Do you know how many problems spread throughout an organization? Because people at the top won't hold somebody, won't have that difficult conversation. This happens all the time. And so I want to say to you, and now everybody that's watching on the live stream wasn't here this morning, but we talked about Alan Mulally and this amazing way he has of being, holding people accountable, accountable in joy, where he just goes to people and says, hey, this is how we do things. And they say, well, I don't really like doing them that way. And he says, that's okay. And then they say, really, it's okay? And he goes, yeah, you don't have to work here, but we will still love you. It's up to you. And he doesn't say it in a sarcastic way. There's nothing but earnestness in it. It's like you get to opt in or not. And too many leaders, because their personal economics says, wait, I've arrived and I'm the CEO and I'm doing this job for me. Why would I want to have that really awkward conversation? Why would I want to take that on? And so they either don't have it or they abdicate, or they delegate it, and they go to, I mean, I, so if a woman I work with, she, Tracy, in fact, I'll, I'll out Tracy, she was, worked in human resources at a company, and she was the HR rep for this department. And the head of the department had an employee who smelled bad. Yeah. And she asked Tracy to tell the person instead of telling her. It's her direct report. They work together. She went and said, hey, you're in HR. You can talk to this person about their body odor. How awful is that? Our job, ladies and gentlemen, is to have difficult conversations. That's why we became leaders. And if we became a leader to avoid those kind of things, then we have to really ask ourselves. Now, for some people, this is not easy, but there is no good reason for not doing it, OK? So that's the first thing. That's the first thing. The second thing I want to talk about is something that many leaders abdicate or delegate, and that is managing their direct reports. Now, this is true the higher you get in an organization. 
I'm amazed at how many CEOs will say, I don't want to manage anymore. I've been managing my whole life. I'm like, well, it's kind of your job. Well, you know, it's tedious. And, and, and you know something? They say, I trust the people I hire. And I hire adults. And the, the ultimate one, and I don't want to micromanage them. <laughs> and I always say, well, if micromanaging is knowing what they're working on, knowing if they're making progress, and giving them feedback and, and coaching about that, then let's all be micromanagers. <laughs> micromanaging is usually what people bring up when they're a leader that doesn't want to manage somebody or an employee who doesn't want to be held accountable. Frankly, the, the, the bigger problem in society today is not micromanagement, it's abdication of management. Okay, so this is a huge one. And many of us can relate to this. I mean, I, I can, I have, it's easy for me to kind of overlook this and go, yeah, I don't know if I need to do that. And here's the thing, I don't care if you're, you're a seventh grade teacher in a tiny school or a line employee in a manufacturing plant or you're the senior vice president of marketing at the coolest, biggest company in the world. Everybody needs to be managed. And when we as leaders decide we're not going to do that, it usually is because we don't necessarily like to, not because it's necessary. God bless you. Okay, so that's, I don't really have any good stories because it's not sexy to talk about how someone was unmanaged. <laughs> it's just bad. Okay, the next one though I do like to talk about and that's the third thing that many leaders who are reward centered don't do is run great meetings. They don't run great meetings. And if you're the CEO of an organization or the head of an agency or the head of a school or a church, your meetings are critical. And when leaders come to me and say, Pat, if I didn't have to go to meetings, and usually they say, or manage people, I'd really like this job. <laughs> I've heard that from a lot of leaders. And what I, what I say to them is, what else do you do? Yeah. You know, I mean, are you kicking field goals for a football team? Are you delivering babies in the, in the maternity ward? Are you growing corn? I, I think you're a CEO or a leader. Your job is to run great meetings and manage people. And, and somehow we as a society have agreed that meetings are just a pain, they're corporate penance, and we just have to get through them. And, and, and the idea of having to sit through them and make them better is something that's not very attractive to most leaders. But it's entirely doable. Some people just think it's impossible. It's not, but it takes real work. And I'm not going to go through all the details of uh, how to run a great meeting. I just want you to know this, that if that meeting is boring to you, then you are not coming close to maximizing your potential as an organization. And here's the main thing. Bad meetings mean you're making bad decisions. It is inevitable. It is inevitable that if your meetings are bad, if they're boring, if they're not focused, that leads to bad decisions. To think that the two things don't go together is crazy. Right? Now, I have seen some really bad meeting management from leaders who were very personal focused, reward centered. One guy I knew, and he was definitely reward centered, he would go to his meetings literally, and when he was, when, when the conversation shifted to something that wasn't personally interesting to him, he would look down and he always had the sports page right next to him in the room. And, and, and he would be down reading about something and people would be talking, they knew he wasn't interested in what they were talking about. And it was crazy to think that it was just like, and, and they just all assumed, well, he has the right to do that because he's the leader. Because we start to accept the fact that reward-centered leadership is okay. I mean, we grow up that way. Alan talked about today that we need to form leaders correctly. Well, if you watch TV and you talk to your, you know, growing up with your parents, we've kind of tolerated reward-centered leaders for a long time. So when one of our leaders does it, we go, well, they've earned the right to do that. It's like, no, they haven't. No, they haven't. Another leader I worked with, she, and she was such a nice person. This, this goes to running great meetings and having uncomfortable conversations. She merged two companies together. And so they had 15 or 16 or 17 direct reports. There were so many they couldn't even fit around a table. They would just take a bunch of chairs and put them in a circle like in a big conference room. And one guy came to the meeting. He was a kind of disrespectful guy. He fell asleep during a meeting. But he didn't just like nod off. You know how you like nod off? He was like full on <laughs> the whole meeting. She, she would be talking to a person next to him and on this side of him, never once said a word during the meeting or after the meeting. Now, the problem was the meeting was horrible and boring. But the other problem was that she wasn't willing to do anything about that or to say to the guy, what the hell is going on here? 
If our meetings are bad, folks, it's our job to make them better, and we cannot rest until they get better. Okay. Fourth thing that many leaders, if they're reward center, don't like to do is to develop a team around them, to do team building, if you will. I don't even like using that word because in the, for years, so, you know, we've talked about this, it's like touchy-feely and like let's get naked and sing and catch each other falling out of a tree. I mean, if there's a business out there where people fall each, catch other people falling out of trees, then that's a good team building exercise. Other than that, I don't know what that has to do with anything in the business, in, in the world. But the thing about it is, a lot of leaders will say, yeah, building my executive team, yeah, I get it. I'm going to delegate that to HR. Or, or we're going to go golfing. We're going to do something social, which is not team building. Team building, the first priority of a leader is to build that team, and they have to be completely involved in it. And you, it, we, I've worked with a lot of leaders. If the CEO is checked out, it almost never works. In fact, we've kind of come to the conclusion when an HR rep or an HR VP calls us and says, yeah, we want to do this, the CEO doesn't have time to talk to you, and we're like, this isn't going to work. Okay? This is not something that you abdicate or delegate if you're a leader. Team building. But it has to be real. It has to have be. And again, it gets into difficult conversations, and what's your personality type, and how are we going to work through this? And again, you guys know this because you're at this conference. But it's amazing when you see a leader who says, I'm not into that, Sometimes we wonder, do they not understand it? And sometimes what we have to do is say, no, they just don't want to do it because it doesn't do anything for them. They might very well be reward-centered. Finally, the fifth thing that leaders often abdicate or delegate if they're reward-centered is over-communicating to their organization. You know, if you're the CEO of an organization, you're really the CRO, you're the chief reminding officer, right? And, and, and I can't overstate this enough, one, because it's about over-communicating, and because so few leaders like to do this. And you know why? If you really ask a leader, why don't you repeat yourself more? And we've already talked about the fact that Alan and, and Gary Kelly at Southwest Airlines, all the best leaders I know are constantly reinforcing key messages. They're finding new ways to do it, but they're not worried about redundancy. In fact, they know that that's necessary. I mean, anybody who's a parent in here understands redundancy, the necessity of it, right? I mean, I am not afraid of my boys coming to me and saying, Dad, if you tell us not to have sex or do drugs one more time, I'm leaving this house. You know what I mean? It's like, I like that. And, and I like to say to leaders, if your people can't do a good impression of you when you're not around, then you're probably not communicating enough. I mean, can't you just see Alan at Ford, people going, hey, one Ford plan. He'd be like, good, good, nice one. Nice one. Try this little head turn a little bit. Because that's what great organizations do. Nobody ever quits an organization because they've been over-communicated to. Or as I said the thing before about the husband whose wife says to him, why don't you ever tell me you love me? And the husband says, well, I told you when we got married, I'll let you know if it changes. And nobody ever said, I hate my, my relationship because I, I get told I'm loved all the time. And yet, leaders don't want to over-communicate. Ask yourself why. Sometimes, with good intentions, they think, I just don't want to insult my audience. Oftentimes, you know something? They're bored. And they're bored with the message, and they want something new. That's where we get this flavor of the month thing. And so they're like, give me a new thing to communicate. And so they move on to the next thing. And they forget that their job is not about entertaining themselves or looking cool. It's about making sure that all the people that work for them are on the same page. And so as it turns out, being a leader is not always interesting or easy or fun. In fact, it rarely is. But it's a fantastic role to play if you're doing it for the right reasons. If you go in with your eyes wide open that this is supposed to be hard, it's supposed to be a sacrifice, it's supposed to be about them and not me, and I'm willing to do whatever is required. But when we, as leaders, find that too much of our motive is coming from personal motivation, we need to do what Alan does, and somebody needs to come to us and say, hey, so is your motive about reward or responsibility? And if they say, yeah, I think reward, it's like, that's okay, but don't be a leader. Most people, though, can adjust their this. Most people just faced with this. We had a, a CEO who's going to be up here next, a fabulous CEO who said the book rocked him because and it, it made him rethink, like, oh, maybe there's some things I need to do different because I've forgotten. 
Again, this is not a black or white thing. So if you're a person that can relate to being a little bit reward-centered, and in the world we live in, I would think that's very common. Alan is the anomaly. But here's the other thing I want to say. If you're a responsibility-centered leader, be careful, because even you can slide. Because you can either start to get a little complacent or tired, or you can start to believe the wonderful things people are telling you about what a good leader you are and start to rest on your laurels. So what I want to leave you with here today is this. When it comes to leadership, before we talk about how to lead, let's first ask ourselves, why are we leading? And whether we're working with clients or we're leading ourselves or we're managing upward or we're teaching the people that work for us who are leaders, let's purify our intentions and our motives because when we do that, it's going to serve our organizations and the people who work in them. And that is all I've got to say. Oh, last thing I want to say in, in plugging my book is it's the shortest one I've ever written, which makes me very happy because I like books that I can get through quickly. And I guess people say that the fiction is more compelling and there's a lot more conflict in it. Um, but I, mean, I want to thank my editor, Tracy, for, for making sure that happened. So thank you for listening to this. And I, I guess we're going to sign off to our people um, who, who joined us in TV land and say thank you very much and God bless. Hi, I'm Pat Lincioni, and I want to tell you about my latest book called The Motive. This is my 12th book, and if you were to stack up those books on a table and tell me you hadn't read any, and were to ask me which you should start with, I'd say it's this one. Because in The Motive, I don't talk about how to become a better leader. I talk about why you should be a leader in the first place. Because if your why of leadership is off, it doesn't matter what the hows are. My hope is that this book will help many leaders adjust their reason for being a leader in the first place, so they can be more effective for the people that they lead. And I hope that some people will read it and decide, you know, maybe I shouldn't be a leader at all. I've been told that the fiction is the best yet because there's some twists and turns and some interesting drama in the book as well. Whatever the case, I hope you enjoy the motive and that it has a desired impact on you and your leadership.